All right, let's continue on. As we said earlier, we are looking at um, piecewise functions and then step functions or a particular type of piecewise function. And then we'll narrow our focus on step functions to a particular type called greatest integer functions. So I'm only gonna do the one example for step functions. I just wanna give you a taste of what they look like. So I have got a menu pricing scheme for CC's Pizza. And again, I've just made up values, but you've seen things like this where, for instance, um, movie tickets might be less expensive for um, kids that are 10 and under, and then the, you know, the price jumps up after that. Uh, anything that's like that where age dictates the price you pay for something, this is a typical step function. So I see that the price of the buffet at CC's Pizza is $6 for kids um, under, or $2 for kids that are under six. So when they hit their sixth birthday, they wind up jumping up to the next price range. So if they're five and under, all the way up to six years old, they're $2. So the price depends on age. That means I'm going to put the price P on the y-axis and their age A on the x-axis. Price depends on age, y depends on x. So it looks like I'm, I'm scanning and I see $2, $4, $6, and $5. Those are my prices. So I'm just gonna scale. So $1, $2, $3, $4, $5, $6. $5, There's no reason not to just scale the Y axis or the P axis in this case by ones. But then my ages are 6, 12, and then 55. Okay, so I'm going to kind of say, all right, this is 6, and then 12 would be the same, um, same jump. And then if I scaled out, I could say, well, 55 might be way down here. So I'm not doing perfect tick marks there, just a general. Probably scaling by sixes would be the best if I were actually going to scale. Okay, so what I know is that my first step is that um, $2 for kids under six years old. So all the way up to age six. So I guess if you're an infant there, you, I could close you in. If you were brand newborn baby, I hope your parents aren't taking you to CCs, but who knows. So I'm going to say anybody up to six years old, I can see, is going to be on the first step of the graph and pay $2. Now, the second step of the graph is going to be that from age six all the way up to age 12. But once you turn 12, then you pay the more expensive price. You pay $4. So at age six, you jump up to $4. And all the way to age 12, you pay $4. But then the next step of the graph is that um, for anybody 12 to 55 years of age, they pay $6 because we're assuming you're going to eat more, right? So you at 12 years old exactly, you pay $6 all the way to age 55. And you are going to start getting a discount because you get the senior citizen discount. Um, so I'm going to come back down and say, all right, that means that at age 55 and up, it's back to $5. So a little discount there. So when you hit age 55, you jump back down to $5. Now, this one's going to be forever and ever and ever. Amen. So I'm going to put an arrow on the end of that step. So, guys, step functions are piecewise functions where I'm taking pieces of different lines. Now, normally we have pieces of horizontal lines. But, for instance, you could have a step function that had, like, diagonal lines that you might have. This would be also considered a step function. That's not as typical that you have a step function that looks has the little diagonal pieces, but it could be. But I think most step functions are little pieces of constant functions because they um, represent something realistic like a pricing scheme like this at a restaurant. Or you might see one where you have prices for um, car insurance and those come down over time usually, right? So car insurance is more expensive for a teenager but becomes less expensive for someone 25 years old, for instance. All right, so 
Um, I want to represent the price of the buffet as a function of age. So when I write this, guys, P of A, that saying price is a function of age or price depends on age. So just because I'm saying write P as a function of A, that doesn't mean you suddenly have F of X as in the problem. So I want to write the equation for the dark blue step. So I just say, oh, well, the dark blue step is a piece of the line Y equals 2. So Y equals 2. If, and now I'm going to say, well, X or A is between 0 and um, uh, 6, 6 years of age. And then my green step is a piece of the line Y equals 4. And this time, I go from the x value 6, or the a value 6, all the way up to the a value 12. And then my purple step is a piece of the line y equals 6. So it starts at a equals 12, all the way up to a equals 55. And then my last step, kind of my royal blue step there, is a piece of the line y equals 5. And, of course, this is for A is greater than or equal to 55. So you're welcome to say from 55 to infinity. That's just sort of an odd way that you'd write it, even though your idea is right. So I have written it now as a piecewise function, and that's my point. Step functions are just a type of piecewise function. All right, that's all I'm going to say about step functions. Now we're going to get, though, into a type of step function. So you have not necessarily seen these double brackets. They look kind of like a double absolute value bar. Those are the greatest integer brackets. So the greatest integer function is something that's totally new to you. So let me show you um, how you do this, and we'll talk about it on the number line. So I'm, I might say, um, okay, I've got 0, 1, 2, 3, four, five. So sometimes it might be easiest for you to picture on the number line as you're first starting to conceptualize what the greatest integer function is. So if I said, okay, the easiest ones to do, if I ask you to evaluate f of zero or f of three or f of negative two. So I'm gonna say, what does the greatest integer value of zero mean? It means zero. What's the greatest integer value of 3 mean? It means 3. What's the greatest integer value for negative 2 mean? It means negative 2. And you might be going, well, this is a dumb function. Like, what's going on there? Well, the greatest integer um, function gives you an integer if you insert an integer. So, of course, 0 is an integer, 3 is an integer, negative 2 is an integer. Well, that's not where this function gets exciting, okay? What's more interesting is what happens when you insert non-integers. So if I said, well, let's do the greatest integer value for 1 half, or what's the greatest integer value for 4.8? Well, this is where the function gets more interesting. So when I insert 1 half, 1 half is right here between 0 and 1 on the number line. Well, it's not an integer, so it's not its own answer. So I'm going to ask you, what's the largest integer on the number line that precedes 1 half? Well, precedes means comes before as you read from left to right. Well, that would rebound to 0. So the greatest integer value of 1 half is 0. Well, it's not a rounding function either, because if I plug in 4.8, 4.8 is right here really close to 5, but it's not an integer. And my job is to pick up the greatest integer on the number line that precedes the input value. Well, 4 precedes 4.8. So the greatest integer value for 4.8 is 4. So you might say, oh, this is a function that just truncates the decimal value. Well, that's not exactly true either. Like, while it is true that f of... 10.7692 is just 10, that you're just going to truncate the decimal piece. That's not what this function is doing. This is called, it's a type of floor function, which means it always takes you downward. 
So for instance, this is where the function gets more interesting. If I ask you to say, um, well, let's input negative 1.2. What is the greatest integer value for negative 1.2? Well, negative 1.2 is here on the number line. Well, remember, you've got to go to the integer that precedes it. So that's going to be negative 2. Now, I'm not rounding because if I was rounding, I would say negative 1.2 rounds to negative 1. You're going, it's a floor function, so you're going lower than. So what if I said, okay, let's be wild and crazy. What is the greatest integer value for negative pi? So let's see here. Well, negative pi is negative 3.14, yada, yada, yada. So negative pi would be about right here on the number line. So do you see its greatest integer value is negative 4? Because I have to go to the integer that precedes it on the number line as I'm reading left to right. So that's all a greatest integer function does. Now let me switch gears for a minute and tell you that you can, you can insert greatest integer value bars um, anywhere just like you can insert parentheses or brackets or absolute value bars so i might say g of x equals um two times the greatest integer value of one fifth x minus nine plus one or i could say h of x equals the greatest integer value of x squared plus x um, minus 1. You can insert greatest integer value bars anywhere you want to in an equation. So in this case, if I said, well, what is g of, we'll say, 7? Okay, well, let's see here. I'm going to have to think through this. Um, 1 fifth times 7 is 7 fifths. 7 fifths minus 9 would be 7 fifths minus 45 fifths. I believe that's negative 38 fifths. All right. Let me think through this. Um, I've gotten the inside down to negative 38 fifths. So negative 38 fifths is the same thing as negative 7 and 3 fifths. So the greatest integer value for negative 7 and 3 fifths would be negative 8. Oh, so negative 16 plus 1 is negative 15. Okay. So what if I said, well, let's do h of 1 half. So let's see here. On the inside, 1 half squared is 1 fourth, and it would be 1 fourth plus 1 half. So that would be 1 fourth plus 2 fourths is 3 fourths. So I've got the greatest in general integer value of 3 fourths minus 1. Well, the greatest integer value of 3 fourths is 0 minus 1 is negative 1. So anyway, you just you think through it just like you would anything else, okay? It can be inserted anywhere. Now, you might say, let me back up for a minute because I didn't address something. You might say, well, why are you saying that this is a piecewise or a step function? Because I thought that's what we were doing. Let's go to your graphing calculator. Let me clear out what's in there. Now, I'm going to go back up. And let me show you where you find this. So if you'll go to your math menu and your num menu where the absolute value bars are, look at choice 5, the INT. That's your greatest integer function. So it won't give you the, the cute little brackets, but if I say I want to do the greatest integer value or function, just, just the greatest integer of x. And then if you graph it, you will see it's a perfectly scaled step function. So once you know it's a step function, by the way, um, if I were to say, well, let's graph the thing by hand. So I've got 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, 1, 2, 3. The one thing that you'll have to add in is open and close circle. So I'll do this in red so you can see it over the top. So I know when I plug in 0, I get 0. But when I plug in 1, I get 1. And when I plug in 2, I get 2. So what happens is you've got the steps that 0 point anything rebounds back to 0. 1 point anything rebounds back to 1. But when I hit 2, I pop up to the next step. So once you do that, you're like, oh, okay, I see how this is going to be. 
so then you can start to do your steps more quickly if you're graphing by hand. And you will do more graphs of this and have to deal with them and talk about something called limits in calculus. Now, let's do a problem that is an application of the greatest integer function. Now, back before there were cell phones and back before um, a lot more um, phone numbers became local. So, like, for instance, when I started college, I lived in Loudoun, and I could not call Knoxville or vice versa without it being long distance. So, um, I had to pay long distance charges when I was at UT to call home to talk to my parents. So we had to be a little bit careful about how we spent our money there. But the deal was that AT&T came out with a, with a long distance service called the AT&T Dime Line. And it was a way to try to entice people to sign up for AT&T as their long distance carrier as opposed to like Sprint and some of the other carriers of long distance at that time. And they said, okay, if you join the dime line, we're going to charge you an automatic $5 a month. So even if you don't spend any minutes talking long distance, you're going to pay $5 a month for the service. But then after you pay for the service, every minute you talk is $0.10 cents per minute. Now, some of the other carriers were doing more like $0.25 cents per minute, but you didn't have the $5 fee off the top. So if you talk three minutes of long distance during the month, your charge for that month based on three minutes of service would be $5 because that's what you got charged right off the top plus 30 cents, three minutes times 10 cents, 30 cents. So that also meant if you talk, for instance, seven minutes, you were going to get charged $5 and 70 cents. Now, according to this model, if I'm saying fictional AT&T, which was a generous AT&T, if you talk, we'll say four minutes and 30 seconds, then technically you only talked four minutes. You didn't make it to the fifth minute. So they would charge you $5 and 40 cents. That's not really how it works in real life, but for fictional AT&T, we're doing an easier problem. Well, what if someone said, well, I'm gonna play the game and I'm gonna talk eight minutes and 59 seconds so eight and 59 sixtieths minutes well if you could gauge it that well then that means you're going to pay five dollars and 80 cents now that's not really how it worked as most things in life don't work that way but in fictional at&t it does so can you see how you'd write an equation that models this pricing scenario so, guys, always when you're trying to fit an equation to a word problem, make a table of values that logically you can determine. And then what you want to do is create an equation and then test those values and make sure that your equation consistently works. So, for instance, some people might go, oh, well, they're charging $5 plus 10 cents per minute. All right, notice my independent variable is M, not X. So you could start char uh, checking. So in this scenario, I could go, well, C of zero is five plus 0.10 times zero, so that's five, that works. C of three is five plus 0.10 times three, that's 530, that works. But look, in this scenario, C of four and a half would be 5 plus 0.10 times 4.5. All right, that is not going to work out to $5.40. Okay, so that tells me that my equation seems to work well for integers, but not for non-integers, but I'm close. Well, what I'm hoping you'll see is, oh, so we need to just tweak the equation a little bit based on what we just learned. And so what you want to do is simply say, well, what would happen if I were to insert greatest integer bars around my M and do it that way? So now check it. Does that change anything? Well, let's see here. Would C of 0 still be 
five dollars. So that would be five plus point ten. Now the greatest integer value of zero is zero, so that's still five. Yay, that one works. That matches our t-chart. Would see if three still be five thirty. Well, the greatest integer value for three is three, so that yep, that's still five thirty. Yes, that matches our t-chart. Well, what about C of, um, it's not where I wrote that. Try that, that again. What about C of 8 and 59 sixtieths? Well, let's see here. When I do the greatest integer value for 8 and 59 sixtieths, I get 8. So that would be $5.80. That is what I see in my T-chart. So yay, that works. Okay, so now I have an equation. So you always... First, set up the word problem or set up a t-chart that actually has values that logically relate to the word problem. And once you have your table of values, then make your equation and make sure that your equation consistently produces the right y values when you plug in the x values from your table. That's the way you do any of these, okay? So you'll see this kind of scenario. So it says, how would AT&T actually charge its customers? Well, this is real life AT&T, and you'll see this kind of scenario lots. So, for instance, if you go to a lawyer and the lawyer charges you for an initial consultation, we'll say $200 for the initial consultation, then the lawyer is going to charge you an additional $100 for the hours that he or she works on your case. Well, if you go in and have um, a visit with the lawyer and it's only a 30-minute visit, the lawyer is going to charge you a full hour of legal time. So you would pay the $200 plus a full hour of legal time. So you'd pay $300 even if you only were with the lawyer for an additional 30 minutes. So this is the way most companies do it is they actually sort of round up on your charges. Hmm. So again, even if you're out of town, then what you're going to do is still pay $5. So if you chart tart for exactly three minutes, you'll still pay $5.30. If you talk for seven minutes, you're still going to pay exactly $5.70. But what if you talk for six minutes and just two out of 60 seconds? All right. And keep in mind, guys, there's smaller time increments than just seconds. But if you go even a bit over six minutes, they're going to charge you for seven minutes, guys. So you're going to get charged for $5.70. The same thing is true. If you talk um, eight and a half minutes, you're going to get charged for a full nine minutes. So your monthly charge would be $5.90. So what you need to do is to come up with an equation that um, would work. Well, a lot of people go, oh, well, can't you just do this? and say five plus, and they'll say, could you do it times um, the number of minutes plus one times 10 cents? That's the way a lot of people will approach it. Well, let's test that. So I'm thinking if I did, in that case, C of, um, we'll say eight and a half, then that's going to be five plus the greatest integer value of eight and a half would be eight and a half plus one is nine and a half times the 10 cent charge. And that's going to be, well, the greatest integer value for nine and a half is nine times 10 cents is 90 cents. And that's going to give you 590. So it does work when um, you talk for a little over a full minute. But does it work all the time? And the answer is no. For instance, look at C of 3. If I do C of 3, then it would be 5 plus. Now, you're going to say 3 plus 1 is 4, the greatest integer value. So keep in mind, I have to do 3 plus 1. So 3 plus 1 is 4. The greatest integer value for 4 is 4 times 10 cents is 40 cents. That gives you $5.40. But when I look back at my table of values, that is wrong. So that means the equation that I generated doesn't work for all possible minute values. So I've got to go back to the drawing board. Okay. So I need to come up with a way to make it round up. 
And there's various uh, ways that you could do this. I could actually come up with a piecewise function. Um, and I've seen people come up with some really clever piecewise functions for making this work. But I want you to see if you can come up with a single equation using the greatest integer um, bars. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase this because it didn't quite work. And let me show you, this is kind of neat, that if I reverse it and say minus 0.10 and then say negative m, it's going to do what we want it to do. Okay? So you would have had to have played around with this for a while to figure this out. It's not like I expected you to just pop that out. But look, that way C of 0 is 5 minus 0.10. And then um, uh, if you do the greatest integer value for negative 0, it's still 0. So that's still $5. That one works. C of 3 is 5 minus 0.10. The greatest integer value for negative 3 is negative 3. And look, that ca causes you to do 5 plus 30 cents. The same would be true for C of 7. So I'm not going to show you that one again. So now look at C of 6 and 2 sixtieths. I'll say 6 and 1 thirtieth. So when you do that one, it's going to give you point, negative point 0.10. The greatest integer value for negative 6 and 1 thirtieth, that's going to round you or take you down to negative 7. And then negative.